On this episode of Still Loading, we get eclipsed digitally. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval, and today on the show, I am joined by someone who works on a bunch of cool stuff, and I'm very excited to speak to him. He is currently working for the company Digital Eclipse, but he has worked at a handful of other places you may have heard of. He's a former producer at Sega, who worked on Sonic the Hedgehog, former senior editor for PSM, uh, the independent PlayStation magazine, and has been in the game industry for for, for a couple of, for quite some time now i have on the show today Stephen frost Stephen, how are you doing today good i'm, I'm doing great uh, thanks for having me on i'm looking forward to chatting about you know all the wonderful stuff we're working on or have worked on at digital eclipse so thanks for uh, having me i am more than honored to have you on the show i'm so excited to, to talk about what you all have been doing at at digital clips for listeners of the show know i'm I'm very into game history. You know, when I do deep dives on individual games, I try to look up interviews and, you know, fun facts and little tidbits, maybe not like a full on deep dive, but a, a deeper dive than, mo- than maybe you would see on another podcast where it's just like, here's the release date and here's the developer, but like right. going into individual stories and stuff. And one of the things that I, that I've talked about before in my show and I have kind of parroted from the video game history foundation is that, you know, there's three different pillars of game history and game preservation, physical, digital, and contextual. And what you guys do over at digital clips is I feel like such a great marriage of everything, uh, the physical, the digital and the contextual because listeners, you know, context is, just as important as owning the game itself. I always give the example, you know, like Animal Crossing New Horizons. If you just had the cartridge of that, no one would understand how, you know, in the year 2020, how much of it, how much it meant to the general public right. when we were all locked down. Context is extremely important. And what you guys do over digital clips, I feel really is this wonderful marriage of that. But before we get into what you're doing specifically at Digital Clips, I want my listeners to get to know you a little bit. So uh, I guess before I ask about specifically your history of the games industry, just kind of say hi to the listeners and introduce yourself and what do you do currently? Sure. Uh, hi, uh, as you uh, eloquently said, my name is Stephen Frost. I am the head of production at Digital Eclipse, um, primarily you know, most of my career in video games was production based, video game production based. So a lot of scheduling budget and, you know, helping to steer the ship in the right direction in, in most cases. And um, I do a lot of that still at Digital Clips, uh, help manage all of the production staff here. Um, but I kind of get my hands dirty with pretty much every project because um, my sort of, um, sphere of like of doing things is is pretty large you know everything from helping the publishing team with submission stuff helping with um maintaining sort of the quality level of the products that we release um you know going through localization docs or or liaisoning with the qa team Um, but really what i hope to do on a daily basis is resolve problems well in advance so that they don't impact our development teams and they're not even aware that there are problems, then they can just focus on what they do best, which is create these great um, compelling products and, um, you know, getting them out there to the world in, you know, as quickly as possible and at the highest level of quality uh, possible. So um, in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of what I do. I, I kind of touch everything um, and help everybody at the company. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy what I do because um, I work with a lot of passionate people and it's, it's a great environment to be working in. I mean, I can see it with the stuff that you guys put out and like even just I, I've had on uh, a previous guest to the show, Mike Micah, who is the president, correct, mm-hmm. of Digital Clips? He sure is. Yeah, he, uh, <laughs> he runs uh, he runs the, the studio and uh, keeps us all in line and, and, and obviously has a, a strong sense of, of vision and passion about the products that we do and help 
also to not only you know drive the ship that is the studio, but help uh, you know really put the finishing touches and uh, the icing, if you will, on the products to make them the best that they can be um, by the time they release. Yeah, I mean, I could I could hear it even when I spoke to him a couple of years ago, just how into ever like just how passionate he was about what he did. So I'm, yeah, I'm I'm excited to chat with you about all this and. Before we get to Digital Clips' recent work, I mean, you guys have been doing a bunch of amazing stuff. I mean, just period over the years, but in the last, like, I would say the last year and a half, it really feels like you've kind of, like, almost had like a like a a, an awakening in the in the Mm -hmm. public sphere. You guys did the Mega Man Legacy collections and the SNK Legacy Legacy, or excuse me, the SNK collection, and that all did well. But I feel like this, like, you guys are getting a lot more well deserved attention. Uh, in the, within the last year or so, Am I, do you think is that like a correct assessment, or do you think it's it's been uh, a lot more popular than before? I even noticed. Um, I think that it really depends on the property, right? And I think what what is the true case is that you could see a progression on how the projects mm-hmm. have evolved and how we present the information, right? Um, I mean, uh, I started on. Uh, at Digital Clips working on the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, which was my mm-hmm. first product. And I'm a big fighting game fan, so that was a huge, uh, awesome thing to be able to work on. And, you know, that product, um, you know, obviously being well-received, but continues to sell even today. I'm amazed. It continues to sell, like, hundreds of thousands of units every, you know, three months, four months, whatever. And so it just keeps... Oh, that's awesome. Literally, we're, like, four years out, four and a half years out since it was released, <laughs> and it consistently still sells and it's it's i think it's getting close to like three million units which is uh, amazing for my verse uh product here but um you know we put i think the key thing is that what we see as an evolution's product is how we present the information to players right um Mm -hmm. we we kind of experimented with a lot of ways and and how that is portrayed and how things are connected together and i think in the early stages in mega man um, even Street Fighter and things like that, it was more compartmentalized. And we felt like, okay, the games are the most important thing. Here's this, here's this, and their own separate departments. And we we never really figured out a way to sort of unify it all. Um, you know, you'd leave the games to kind of go look at, you know, packaging art or behind the scenes content and yeah. things like that. And over the years, that has sort of been the mainstay uh, to a degree where there's been this separation, if you will, between games and the content that uh, is covering the games. Mm-hmm. And it def- doesn't really, really click um, until, like you called out you know, last year, Atari 50. And to some degree, the Turtles, the TMNT collection, Cowboy yeah, collection, the- um, you can see sparks of of connecting stuff a little bit more there. There was a turtle layer, and it was an attempt for us to like take all the different types of materials uh, that you may have and then connect them all in some unified interface. And, you know, you could see that bridging over to Atari 50, which is obviously the, even the further progression, which is now there is a kind of a, a completely unified interface where not only games, but all of the ephemera and all of the materials uh, associated with those games are connected together in one single kind of interface, if you will, um, mm-hmm. in order to tell a unified story. Um, so I think that while, you know, our goals haven't necessarily changed throughout the last four or five years um i think we've learned uh, ways to improve it and kind of stumbled our way into figuring out how to best unify it all and, and put it into a uh, you know take all the components and 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 finish solving the puzzle to put it into a singular picture and interface for people and i think that's where the biggest evolution has taken place I get you. I get you. And uh, I mean, it, it shows. I mean, I, it's been, I actually, I have the Mega Man collection. I, I have the SNK collection. So it's been cool to see the evolution of what Digital Clips has been doing with these types of uh, re-releases. The remaster is not the right term. It's it, the way I've been describing it to other people is it's almost like a like you know, there's different genres of games. I almost consider this a documentary, uh, like a. Like I don't know if that's a, a correct the correct way to describe it. I almost consider like the genre of the games you guys do, even though they are ports of older games to newer systems, it's almost like done in a documentary style. Yeah, I mean, we kind of coined it as the sort of interactive documentary um, phrase now, and um, you know, we our company as a whole is split up into a couple of different types of focuses, and we 
we have done remaster. You know, Wizardry is sort of a re remake remaster kind of thing, depending on how you view it. And before that, we did a remake of of uh, Medieval, the PS One game for mm-hmm. PS Four for Sony. So. You know, while our bread and butter are sort of these interactive documentary kind of releases now, we still have teams who are doing, you know, original games that um, harken back to that classic era, early early days, retro kind of style of gaming experience. And then also we have teams that are working on sort of these like wizardry, kind of like these 3D, you know, remakes, um, remasters of these of these older types of games. But Regardless, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to take, uh, as an overarching goal, trying to take these older properties, older games that resonated with us when we were younger and were crucial kind of experiences that helped shape um, the industry as a whole, whether it's, you know, arcades, computers, or consoles. Mm-hmm. Um, these, are, these are the games that helped spark a million other games, right? And were the foundations of it all. And we feel that it's important to educate people now um, about the importance of those experiences and games and why you should care about them. Um, and that's why sort of why everything that we do sort of harkens back to a little bit that, that early, that early era of games, um, and then looking at ways in order to modernize stuff so that, uh, modern audiences can enjoy them as well and also learn why, um, you should care about them. Yeah, yeah, I I could especially see the what you're talking about with the modernization of some of these older experiences in Atari 50, where you would have the original version of like Breakout, and then you would have you know the digital clips spin on it type of thing. Um, I, I really I really enjoy that. I really enjoy those elements that you that you all add into it. Before we continue on with this, I what I wanted to get into was my, for my listeners to get to know a little bit more about you and your history uh, working in the games industry. And you you've you've been a, you've been around the block, my friend. Like you worked in QA, you've worked in the press, you've yeah. worked obviously as a producer, and you, you've been in a number of different places. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask uh, specifically was, since you you like I said at the beginning, you worked. Uh, at Q- as QA, you worked at PSM, and then you've also worked in on the games themselves. What's something, w- without going through all, all of your credits, because you actually have a wonderful video on your YouTube channel uh, kind of going through your history uh, in the games industry, but what I wanted to ask was since you've been kind of on both sides of it at at this point, you've you worked in the press. I know it was back right. in the early two thousands, but still, you worked in the press and you've worked as a game dev. What's one thing you wish each side would know about each other? Well, yeah, I can answer that actually well, and this is what I feel benefited um, me. So when I was during during college, when I went to University of Oregon, I actually worked in game development. I started in QA, like you said, at a studio called um, Dynamics, which was owned by Sierra of King's Quest fame and, and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, so um, I learned a lot about how games were developed and the whole process of how they get made and the challenges that teams have and why decisions are made. And I experienced that for a few years before I actually started writing about games. And Mm -hmm. what that did is that it helped to, um, you know, drive my writing and how I approach things. So even from reviews, uh, features, and anything I wrote about games, I approached it from the mindset of understanding the challenges of what developers go through in order to release these products into the world. And so I think it gave me a little bit more insight and also, uh, like I said, a bit more understanding of why things are the way they are. And so I tried to, I think, tend to present things in in a bit more of a positive and understanding perspective. And, Mm -hmm. And I strongly encouraged you know, people not to like just diss on games. This was the era where people, if they hated a game, would really just like rail into games. Um, and it's generally because most people who write about games, especially back then, um, had no experience making games. Um, it was this magical separate world to them. And um, they didn't understand why things were the way they were. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, explaining to many people in the games industry, editors and writers, Mm -hmm. you know, what it's like working on games and and how the whole process works. And I think what that did is like, like for me, gave people a perspective 
um, on on why things are the way they were. And I and I think when you understand that, your appreciation for games and your understanding of issues or even accomplishments uh, are amplified a bit. Um, so. You know, that's always been my big thing. It's not necessarily something that's possible. You can't tell every person who writes about games yeah. <laughs> to, to work on a game. Um, but I encourage them that like when they do interview people or they have a chance or they have friends of people who work in the games industry developing or working on games, ask them questions about stuff. Get a little bit more understanding and insight into how games are made. And I tell you, it will change your whole sort of perspective on how you write about them, how you approach them. Um, and things like that. Um, so I think that would be my biggest wish in the world that everyone who writes games could like work on a game for a little while and understand the whole process. And I think things would change dramatically. Uh, I, in, can, in I could understand and relate to that. I, so I went to school for game design. Mm -hmm. Um, didn't I, I've learned I'm not much of a game designer. Uh, I, I didn't have the drive to, for, you know, either to get into the programming side or right. the art side and stuff like that. Found I like talking about games a lot more, hence I, what I'm doing here. But I, I say all that because I think going through college and learning the ins and outs of game, I have a degree in it. Like mm -hmm. I have a, an associate in game design and I think that gave me a much larger appreciation for when if a, if a game is quote unquote bad it's not bad because i don't like it it's bad for you know okay maybe there's specific design choices i didn't agree with but even then i'm not like ripping into the developers yeah for that it's something where it's like you know there's i mean and people know it now especially with stuff in, re, in semi-recent news i mean it's now a couple of years old but you know with cyberpunk like most most people don't blame uh, CD Projekt Red for that. They blame the higher ups at the company for for the issues that that game presented. So I I, I agree with you in the sense that it's it, it's very helpful, not even just for uh, you know people working in the news and in, in as game reviewers and whatnot, but I feel like even in the general public, you were saying how back that people. Uh, like to kind of shit on games a little bit, right? To put it bluntly, and I feel like that's coming back, <laughs> yeah. Well, at least on Twitter, not a big fan of that. So I, I'm all for this type of discourse of just uh, bring context to your to your criticism. Yeah, and and that's the thing. I, I think any developer worth their weight um, is certainly open to criticism um, and feedback. Uh, why wouldn't they? They want to improve, but. The, the challenge is that when people are just yelling across the vast canyon, just like stuff about that's wrong about the game, but don't provide any necessarily useful feedback on how it might be improved based off of their perspective and or it's just an emotional response, right? But I'll tell you this, if you know we've gotten these and these are the ones that we listen to, people who state like, hey, notice this, you know, this might be the cause and or, you know, this might be a way that you could uh, you know, resolve this issue, right? And you're like, mm -hmm. wow, like the person has put thought into this, right? They've obviously had a problem, but they've thought about it a little bit. Um, they aren't complaining. They're kind of giving feedback, right? Um, yeah. And those, we will listen to that stuff endlessly um, and, and take it to note. In fact, in a lot of cases, we have gone out of our way to fix things um, or add features to a game uh, because people were very passionate and articulate about it, and I can and I can give an example of this for uh, Turtles: Cowabunga Collection. Um, yeah. We added features to that game in a patch specifically for the uh, tournament fighters um, audience. Um, there's a big sort of you know underground tournament fighters fighting game community, and they they kind of spend so much time um, doing hacks and mods to the original game in order to make it perfect and balanced for, for fighting game competitions. Okay. Um, and they came up and they did these PowerPoint slides asking us to like, Hey, could you add this? Could you add this? And they articulated why it was important, how you could, we could go about doing it and things like that. And it was such a thoughtful, they actually did on Twitter. They did like almost like PowerPoint presentations, uh, for huh. us about that. Um, and I read through it and I looked at it and I'm like, wow, they actually went and, and explained why this is a problem or why they hope that we can fix it. They explained how we could potentially fix it. And we did. We took some of that stuff and we, we never planned to, but we uh, implemented it in a patch, um, including unlocking a hidden mode in the Japanese version of Tournament Fighters um, and things like that. So um, I always say this to people. 
there is nothing wrong with sort of wanting a game to be to be great and trying to provide feedback to developers because there are certain problems wrong with it and things like that. But, you know, the way you should approach it is, you know, uh, how can we kind of try to address this? Not sort of like a yelling kind of tone because that gets you nowhere. And trust me when yeah. I say odds are if you've come across the problem, we've come across it many times. <laughs> and there are reasons why specifically it's not fixed or ready. Yeah. And uh, once again, that that lends into your point about if you understood the process of game design a little bit it would help you be able to realize okay maybe they couldn't do it for this this and this reason right. that doesn't mean you should shouldn't like it doesn't mean you should at least shouldn't at least try to pitch it uh, you know, over twitter respectfully of course yeah. none of yeah. you none of you angry people please uh but yeah and, and it kind of reminds me of the idea of where i feel like uh you know I, I see this online and I, I agree with it. Everyone should work in public service or uh, right. you know, public service industry yeah. type of thing. I was a cashier for four years at a, right. at a grocery store uh, that was awful, uh, and, but it gives you some much needed skills in terms of dealing with like hostile people and public spaces and all mm-hmm. this other stuff. So likewise, if, if you're going to get into the, area of games criticism or podcasting or what you know what you're going to get into some type of media surrounding games it definitely benefits and i would argue it enhances your content or whatever it may be if you understand at least a little the behind the scenes stuff with it yeah i'd agree with that for sure another question about your time in the games industry you know looking back over it because you started all like you said before at dynamics which you were one of the qa analysts for cyber gladiators and rama i see yeah um and so between being a qa analyst and then work and then becoming a producer what would you say is one of the biggest differences or like adjustments you had to make when you started out in qa and then ended up becoming a producer later on was there a big shift that you had to uh, a big adjustment you had to make or was it a more smooth than you were expecting uh yeah that's that's a good question um so when i got into qa i wasn't sure you know what path i was going to go on i just knew i liked games and i was uh sort of the time I was meandering college what i should take i ended up like switching over to computer science so i could have certainly gone down the you know, engineering programming track um, during that time. And I think similar to you, I actually started transitioning a little bit into design work a bit because I, mm-hmm. I felt that like, I wanted to like have an impact in games um, to some degree. And so I started in QA and I was like, oh, I'm helping, you know, shape the quality of this product. I'm working with the development team. And back then um, it was very oftentimes different than it is now. Back then, the, the QA teams, at least at Dynamics and other studios that I, I'm familiar with back then, um, QA and the development teams were very closely knit together. Like, they would talk to each other regularly. They, you know, they'd engage with the product. It, like, it was a very open sort of relationship. QA was viewed as, like, very important part of the development pipeline mm-hmm. um, and things like that. And, you know, and the scope of games kind of warranted that. You know, now... Oftentimes, you have games that are so big that you have potentially hundreds of QA people, right? It's and it's impossible to have sort of that relationship, yeah, that intimate relationship with the development, right? And and it, and and it's become like QA has become like the services kind of thing. Um, it's become something that you kind of bring on, and even though it's super important, it's viewed now as a service just because it's like a large number of bodies. But when I was doing it, it was it was certainly more. It felt more important and for more connected to the development team. Um, I got to know people on the development team. I talked to them regularly, um, and I got more involved because they, you know, they trusted my instincts. So I started doing some design stuff, um, you know, and 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 things of that nature. I and I got exposed a bit to the sort of the production track and and sort of the importance of that and and what was needed, um, and and what the daily tasks were for that, things like that. And so Mm -hmm. that kind of perked my interest because it's sort of like the closest, you know, thing I could think of as in in movies to like a director producer kind of scenario where you're helping to drive the vision of the product. Right. And, um, you're like, you're like the cheerleader for the team and, and you're trying to empower everyone on the team to do the best that they can. And, you know, your job is to like get everything, um, all the troubles out of the way and take care of the hazards and, and the problems and just let them focus and do their job. And it, it really kind of uh, got me interested. Um, and I and I really liked 
um, sort of being able to learn and interact with the different departments. And I think that was the key thing that drew me to productions because I really wanted to understand how all the cogs, you know, the machine worked, like all the gears, like what were the yeah. departments and how do they interact with each other and what exactly do they do? And I just wanted to learn more about game development in general. And, you know, as a producer, you kind of have to understand to a degree and interact with every department to a degree. Um, mm -hmm. And so that really kind of interested in me. Um, however, at the, without going into too many details, you know, at that time, this was in Oregon, um, there weren't many game developers in Oregon. There was literally Dynamics and there was Trilobite who developed a seventh guest and 11th hour. Um, there mm -hmm. was, and I think there's one more, but there wasn't much game development going on in Oregon. Um, and so I knew that like, if I really wanted to um, expand and kind of get an opportunity to work on bigger games and a larger company, I'd probably at that time either have to move to California or Texas. Uh, those were the two hotbeds at that time <laughs> of like mm -hmm. game development. And so I interviewed and things like that. And, and eventually, um, you know, it was a little bit challenging because uh, at that time, there weren't many companies who would hire out of state, right? They already had people in state who were local yeah. who would hire. And so trying to get a job and get them to move or like convince, you know, <laughs> move there and, and land, it was, it was difficult. Um, and so at the time, uh, I kind of uh, was reading magazines by this company called Imagine Media. They did Next Generation, PC Gamer, and a bunch of other game magazines that I really liked. And um, just through constant trials and, and, um, and trying and reaching out to people, I landed a, a job there as a webmaster. Because during this time, I was also really interested in, in web design and website. This is the early days of HTML <laughs> yeah. um, and, and things like that. And so I was big on website design because it was a very visual language you make a change you can see it right away right and it was sort of like mm -hmm. it helped to kind of satiate my programming itch to a degree and um so i was big on that so i, I managed and i and i did writing as well as part of my job in qa wrote a lot about um you know bug reports or or issues or presentations and things like that and so i got a bit of a, a writing um background and so i landed a job sort of as a webmaster slash editor at Imagine, and I worked on the basically the website for a magazine called Ultra Game Players. And so there, I sort of updated the websites, um, you know, did the design stuff. I also wrote articles, and eventually got an opportunity to write a review for a fighting game for Ultra, actual Ultra Game Players magazine. And the, and the fighting game was uh, Killer Instinct Gold uh, for the N64. And since I was a fighting game fan, that was a big, you know, my first official magazine review. And so yeah. Um, you know, it spent endless nights, like making sure that I was right. I was like, I, you know, I stayed up late because this is my first, like really official kind of, uh, article that was being published anywhere. And so I was so nervous about it. Um, so anyway, I uh, reviewed it and, uh, they, uh, everyone loved it. The magazine loved it. And so they, I got to do more and eventually got asked to help start up a PlayStation magazine called PSM. Um, and that was a blast, you know, it was my, my twenties and, uh, you know, just, just, it felt like having friends and hanging out and playing games and talking yeah. about games. Right. Um, but I knew in the back of my head that I really wanted to get back into game development. That's why I was in California to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I just made the decision, like, you know, I gotta, it's been great. I love this job, but it's just time to get back to game development. That's what I feel that I need to do. And so I, you know, I quit and I started up at EA, um, and, you know, uh, just went EA to Activision to Sega, um, I was Sega for about almost a decade, working on a bunch of, uh, you know, games, including Marvel stuff, Sonic stuff, um, and then reached a point where, um, after all that time, it was just like go, 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 go. Um, I was a little bit burnt out um, and kind of. Uh, I could, I could, I could understand that. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was getting a little bit tired, and I and I needed sort of a break. Um, and um, uh, coincidentally, Sega at the time had decided that they were going to move the the headquarters of the company down to Southern California to be closer to merchandising and Hollywood and, and all that stuff. Um, so I took that mm -hmm. sort of as a sign and said, like, you know what, I'm just going to take a break uh, from the games industry for a while and just catch up on life and, and, and enjoy it. Um, and I did for about a year, year and a half, I, I took off and just, and just did as many things as I could that I missed out on and, and, and just like take it, took a deep breath. Right. 
And uh, I knew when I wanted to get back that I didn't want to work at a big studio anymore. I had done the Segas, EAs, and Activisions. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be uh, in a smaller, kind of like back to the Dynamics days to a degree, right? Smaller studio, um, being able to interact with everyone. Uh, it's a growing studio. And, um, you know, how can I help this company grow and where are we going? And, uh, you know, uh, several of the people who work here uh, at Digital Clips were also an editorial at the time, like Mike Micah was there and some other folks who were working mm -hmm. on magazines at the same time I was. And so it was sort of coming back to family a bit. And also Street Fighter was the project that they needed me for. And so that combination was like, yeah, this seems like a, a, a great fit um, here. And so um, I've been here, you know, since then for like, I don't know, six years, I think now, five, six years or so. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been great. And, uh, it's, it's been a fun journey. That makes me think of a question that I'd be curious as someone who's worked in the game industry in both small and large teams from an outsider's perspective, from, at least from my own, I, I feel like one of the things I would love to see AAA studios in general, and not just like smaller studios, but just, I mean, I guess you could even consider it to make a smaller teams, but I'd like to see the return of, smaller size games maybe like you know there's triple a but maybe right. like the i guess you could call it double a games i feel like that's something that the industry sorely needs to kind of um so you you stop these gigantic bloated budgets of all your other ones but that's just like i said my perspective from someone who's has never been in the industry does not know the ins and outs in your own uh, in your own view, without you don't have to name any companies, of course. I don't want you to. <laughs> I don't want you to get in trouble with anyone. But in your own view, do you do you agree with that? Do you feel like there should be smaller scale teams again to kind of like or have a better mix of the large scale, large, medium, and small scale? Right. Does that make any sense? What I'm talking no, about? No, it totally doesn't. Ironically, I did like I was. I think I tweeted out something like last week that like this the the <laughs> the dearth of this is like uh, this is the problem that. Um, uh, there's too much doubling down on what's considered the triple A, and it and it's sort of like the the sink, you know, the 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 survive uh, or sink kind of scenario. And people are placing such big bets on these multi-year games, and anything could mess it up. Like just, um, you know, something like COVID hitting, or like bad timing because of something else, or like something happened in the world that was terrible that took everyone's attention away from it. And you launch during this period, and it doesn't get the coverage and reception that it, it needs to in order to, mm -hmm. to really blow up. And that studio dies, or a good chunk of the studio dies. It's such a, um, you know, like a delicate machine this whole everything this whole or thing. nothing mentality yeah and it's and it's crazy and 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 i think it's a twofold problem um on the consumer side and rightfully so i mean they are, are going to expect this but i feel that the consumer side is continuing to expect more and more and more for their money right um mm -hmm. the this this the the speed in which the expectation of what uh, a game has to be for your 60 or 70 dollar price tag has like escalated um, quite a bit in, in the last few uh, years, especially. And it's gotten difficult for companies to, to keep up with that. Um, consumers are very fickle um, with their money, especially now. I don't think we've quite recovered yet completely. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big problem. And also, I think that vice versa, you know, also along with that is that there is a, um, a, a greater shortage of editorial uh, sort of outlets that are talking about games and spraying the word. I mean, there's a lot of indie stuff, but like you see a lot of major players in the game space who are talking about games, writing about games, uh, having to shut down or losing staff and stuff. So just yeah. the the word, getting the word about about games, is more difficult. Uh, if you don't spend a ton of money advertising on every medium possible just getting the word out organically through outlets now is really challenging. Um, there just aren't uh, sort of enough of them. And so you have a situation where um, it's harder to get your word about games. People aren't aware of them. There is a, a large amount of, of competition because now that we've sort of switched to this digital uh, frontier to a degree, and most things are bought digitally, and we have services like Game Pass and others mm -hmm. where it's like a streaming a sort of equivalent of a Netflix streaming service. 
accessibility to, to so many games is so quick and easy. And people have developed this sort of like play it for a little bit. Nope, move on, move on, move on, right? It's, it's become this sort yep. of, of just creature in itself. It's not like before in the early days, we're like, okay, I bought a game that was $70. I'm only buying three games this year. Even if it's not great, I guess I'm going to play it. Like I'm going to like mm -hmm. spend time with it and and do it. Um, now it's just people move on very very quickly, and it's, unless you have some sort of way to engage them constantly, um, people's attentions divert very quickly and very easily. And so you have so many games that in under normal circumstances could do well, uh, but once people hit any sort of problem or brick wall, they just move on. Um, so, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a rough thing. I think that a combination of spending way too much money, um, in these, sh what they hope will be a sure bet, um, and also sort of streaming services to a degree where a consumer can just spend $15 a month and just have access to so many games has really, um, changed how things are. Um, and, and to your point, I do think that, more and more consumers need to get comfortable with these mid-tier games um, yeah. and at a more affordable, lower price. And it allows, you know, instead of a four-year development, maybe it's a two-year development or a year and a half-year development, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not so horrible. If the game doesn't do super well, you know, odds are the studio can still kind of go on and make something else. Um, you know, we have to get a return to this era where we're okay with this eight to 10-hour experience, right? We don't need... The forty-hour, eighty-hour thing with twenty billion side quests uh, and open-world yeah. scenarios, like mm -hmm. it's too much. And me, uh, like, I miss the days. I mean, that's why I love these character-driven, story-driven experience, like the Uncharted's and things like that, um, mm -hmm. because they were all manageable. Like eight to ten to twelve hours—that is perfect for me. Like, I want to be able to play a game, finish it, and move on and enjoy the experience because my time is limited as well. Like, I could never play. Uh, a hundred hour open world game anymore like it just i wouldn't even try to it's, uh, it, you know. i can tell you as someone who is currently trying to it's mm -hmm. not open world i'm trying to play through yakuza zero oh, for right, the first yeah, time yeah and that's like an 80 90 hour experience and I, i'm only i'm i'm doing it piecemeal like an hour and a half a night here two yeah. hours there because i have other games to play for the show yeah. i have i'm a parent i work full time so i totally get what you're saying yeah, it's, normal you're like a normal person <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, but that's why I like, I don't think the base game, and this is where like perception and like expectations, like I don't see why a team couldn't create a 10 to 12 hour experience, let's say 15 hour experience, see mm -hmm. what the reception is like. If there is a good reception, then, then that's when you do more DLC or games as a service or things like that. There's no need to start with an 80 hour game. Like you don't need to start with an 80 hour game and then add more content to it. You know what I mean? And I think, that's the thing that there's this expectation now that like people are buying one game a year or two games a year and they need each one to be 40, 50, 60 hours of content. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of crazy in my, in my opinion. So I think consumers should like settle back and, and get acclimated and, and, and be happy with the 10 to 15 hour experience um, that uh, games should be i think uh for most in most cases not all but in in a lot of cases um and it's you know in that way you can have your short experiences you can have your medium size experience and then you can have your triple a stuff still um you know that you you need to have but i think that like if if people started reining that back in again and 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 you know, even even if this case like a game is forty hours instead of eighty hours, I don't think it's going to be a shocking thing. Like people are still going to enjoy it, and you don't have to add the fluff of side missions or miscellaneous yeah. quests that don't mean anything. Your whole experience can be a very tight and succinct um, experience, and I think that's what's sort of key. When it starts to go beyond that, it's it's just getting too much for the sake of of being larger. So I do agree with you from that standpoint. I I wholeheartedly hope that. Um, we get to a point where there's more medium-sized games that are released um, at you know lower price points, and also allows studios to kind of uh, not invest their whole fortunes on on a success. Right. 
I would love to continue on this train of conversation, but since we do have a time limit, I want to move on to something sure. else. And because uh, I'll, I'll be honest, man, I could talk about this for easily <laughs> another hour on just uh, your opinions on different uh, game industry trends and consumer trends and all that other stuff. Me, if you'd ever be up for it, I'd be honored to have you back on to discuss kind of like like a general chat about yeah. stuff like that. That would sure, be anytime. awesome. But in speaking of teams that kind of keep their uh i don't know i don't know what digital clips's budgets are but the team is much smaller like you mentioned yeah. before keeping the team small so that way they can have a much more intimate collaborative work environment uh digital clips has been doing a lot of amazing stuff lately so i want to uh shift to talk about what you all have been doing over there recently so i want to start with kind of the thing that i we mentioned at the top of the episode that really seems to have resonated with the public a lot in the last year or so. And that's your Atari 50th anniversary collection. Mm -hmm. Um, That is a phenomenal thing. I I mentioned at the top of the episode that you guys really seem to be able to take the three pillars, quote unquote, that the Video Game History Foundation talks about of the physical, digital, and contextual preservation. And you kind of combine it all into what is the Atari 50th anniversary, which is this amazing time like it's a game that uh, you play through a timeline and it has interviews with people in from atari back as far back into the 70s up mm-hmm. to the when the original version of atari quote unquote right. i know it's gone through a bunch of different iterations and sold a whole bunch but essentially after the jaguar kind of got discontinued that was the end of atari as we knew it from that 20 year period ish uh so i i guess to kick it off with with this talk about atari 50 like what was your experience working on that and what were there any challenges that you that you kind of encountered when having to make this massive collection of a game it has there's so many individual games on there combined with all the research right. that must have been done like it's just it's an impressive feat thanks um yeah it was a it was a great project you know it as with many of our projects um, it, it, it changed and morphed over, over, over development. Um, but I will, I, I'll start with this statement, which is, um, it harkens back to like team sizes and things like that too. Um, I think, and, and I think this resonated with me and this is a little bit cheesy, but like we were showing, um, some of our projects to, nothing wrong um, with cheese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were showing some of our our unannounced projects over to some uh, some people, some publishers, and things like that, uh, just discussing stuff like we normally do. And one of the mm-hmm. person, one of the one of the people who were in the meeting, and they kind of looked at what we did, and they're like, "Yeah, this this can't be replicated." And and I was just like, "Oh, he's being nice or whatever." But I started thinking about that statement um, a little bit, and um, I, I I do agree that there it will be tough for people to replicate what we do for a couple of reasons. And, and I'll, I'll share them here. One is, and this is the cheesy part, but um, you know, every team member who works here, every development team member, and even, you know, even if they work in uh, other areas that aren't specific to games, um, they're very passionate about the, the titles that we release and the subject matters that we release. Um, mm-hmm. We specifically work on certain titles because the teams are, specifically passionate or it had some sort of impact in their lives in a monumental way. And I say this, like every, like Atari was an example of this. Every single person who worked in Atari either like had, had some story about Atari that was key to them or Atari had an emotional impact on their life where they grew up with yeah. Atari. And when you have a team uh, of our sizes, you can be in a situation where everyone has had sort of that experience. And and when you have that united experience about a property or IP or company, um, people organically put forth like 110% because they're passionate mm-hmm. about it. When you, and I'm not going to say this all the time, but when you work in a team with like 150, 200 people, you know, people, there's going to be bound to people who are there doing their job. They may like what they're doing. But they odds are they may not be as passionate about the subject matter they're doing, the game that they're doing, or whatever, right? Um, yeah. And I think why um, our products uh, have sort of like been able to achieve kind of the quality level they have with our team sizes and things like that is because every individual person is passionate about each particular topic. Um, mm-hmm. There's that sort of uh, um, 
uh, component um, too. But the other component is that we have a lot of people uh, who have diverse backgrounds and a lot of people who come from editorial um, at this company. And it's probably from a company perspective studio, probably the largest that uh, collection of like former editorial people um, <laughs> really that I can think of in a company. Um, and I think because of that, it lends itself well, our products lend themselves well to telling a story of something, right? Or an, an editorial component uh, to it that may not come naturally to other companies or studios, right? Um, so I think those two things really were key. Um, but the challenge, of course, of telling a story is that oftentimes when you start out a project, you're not sure what story that is. Um, you don't have materials that you need. You don't know what games are going to go into it. You don't know if, who you're going to be able to interview or what questions they're going to be able to answer. Um, so you start out with this sort of blank slate. Now, I say this only from the standpoint that from a development perspective, from a production perspective, it's very scary, right? Because for another yeah. project, um, like a traditional game, you can lay out a map of like how long things are, right? <laughs> Many games have been made before. You can kind of ascertain how long things are going to take to do. And you can plot that out. The challenge with sort of the products that we do is that we don't yet know how all the pieces are going to come together. We have like a bunch of puzzle pieces on the table. Um, and some are missing and some we haven't found yet. And how do we arrange those in a way uh, to create a picture for the player, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of this. Like at the start of Atari 50, I originally thought that like we were only going to do 50 games because 50 games to represent 50 years of Atari. Um, yep. And that sort of makes sense to me. Um, we also didn't want a situation where we threw like hundreds and hundreds of games at you without any sort of information or context or anything, and you're just like, well, what should I do with these hundreds of games, right? Because Atari is no, uh, has released many uh, collections. They've released hardware. Like, there's no shortage of Atari games out in the wild uh, in that mm -hmm. regard. So we knew we had to do something different. Um, and we knew that if we just threw a bunch of games at the wall and gave it to people, no one would really care. They're like, I don't even know which one to start playing. Um, so we, we kind of came to this... Um, this quick, you know, kind of discovery, like, okay, explaining why these games are important and choosing the games carefully, curating them um, is going to be very, very important because we want to sort of explain to players why each of these games um, should be considered as something you should look at, even for a short amount of time, right? And so that's when the mm -hmm. pieces of the story started coming together. We started interviewing uh, a lot of people kind of looking through their responses um, and, and we kind of eventually put together this sort of idea of like, okay, this is the flow of how we want this movie to kind of unfold, this, this documentary to unfold. Um, and that solely came over the course of development because we were constantly removing and adding games up to the last minute. And every time we removed games, we'd have this group discussion about like, okay, if we remove this game, what's going to fill it? What is important? Like, why did we remove it? Why are we adding this? Yeah. And, and people don't think about that when they got like, oh, like, oh, they just took a bunch of games and they put it in there. It's like, we spent so much time discussing specifically the games that were in this collection. Um, just hours and hours and hours just on that one aspect alone. So, there's a lot of challenges with not knowing what story you're going to do. And you're hoping that when you get all the pieces together, um, that mm -hmm. is something compelling. Um, secondarily, the challenge comes with just getting uh, legal rights and permissions. Um, yep. It's a huge uh, time sink. And it's something that I think consumers generally take for granted in most cases. Um, they just mm -hmm. don't think about it. But so much time... Um, is involved. I give an example, like to get like one screenshot, I was tempted to get one screenshot and one uh, body of text cleared. Um, and it, and it, it took six weeks. Dear God. Um, so that's just <laughs> one screenshot and one body of yeah. text. So I share that as a, as a, as an example of, you can see, you see the content that is in that collection. Um, it is. It takes a lot of time, and yeah. we try to include as much as we can. But we just run out of time to try to pursue things. And um, you know, as I'm sure you've talked to in the past, as these games are so old, um, the the question of ownership is becomes murky, mm -hmm. right? Um, companies close. They sort of sell off rights, or people say they have the rights, and it's really, really challenging. I mean, we came across 
situations, and I've said this before, where people thought that they owned the rights, but they didn't. And then worse, there were people who didn't think they owned the rights, but then we discovered that they did. Um, so what? it's <laughs> it's really, really tough. Like, you know, no one's around anymore. Um, you can't, it's hard to track the chain of like, of legal, you know, ownership, um, across. And this is something that we tackled every single, uh, collection we do because of the, the years that have passed in, in these sort of, in these mm-hmm. sort of situations. So, you know, the two biggest challenges for us are like, yeah, figuring out what the story is. And then second, secondly, it's sort of like, you know, legally, what can we do and, 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 and how can we sort of overcome some of these challenges uh, due to uncertainty? Because we can't just release something when we're uncertain of it. You know what I mean? We have to be yeah, pretty darn confident, well, right? Be held liable for exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. So, um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and during the development of Atari 50, it kind of evolved and we, we quickly found out as the story was progressing that we needed more games because there were key things to call out and that's how the mm-hmm. game kind of grew. Um, and then during that time, uh, we also said like, you know, because again, going back to the passion, because so many of the team members were influenced dramatically by Atari and its history, they really wanted to do their part in some way to kind of show um, their appreciation for Atari and also um, kind of add new value to the, the game, which is where sort of the, the reimagined games came in. Um, it really literally is members of the team saying like, this aspect of Atari really resonated with me when I was a kid or even now. And I want to do something to celebrate that. And it happens, you know, it, 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 ha- it happened that like, there was such a variety of, of ideas of what people wanted to do. Jeremy wanted to create something for, to sort of be an homage to the vector based arcade games that he loved so mm-hmm. much growing up. Um, uh, Dave uh, really loved, um, you know, haunted houses and wanted to do something cool or like a modern take on that. Um, and we had Neo breakout, you know, cause we had uh, Jason who was a huge breakout fan. So I want to do that. And, and then, but the big one that I was shocked that um, Atari actually let us do, which is to finally finish the sword quest um, series. Yeah. Um, so we, we never thought they would allow us to do that. Um, but we, I was so happy to hear that. Yeah, it was, it was great. And it's kind of like, we took what the initial, um, ideas were and suggestions uh that were kind of publicly available and we kind of built upon that um dave did an awesome job um kind of building upon that and we had a guy dan who kind of helped write the sort of the riddles and and the text for the manual and things Mm -hmm. like that so again it was a sort of a uh, kind of a passion passion product and i i do think that like i jokingly say this to atari but really we should apply for like the Guinness world record because the game was officially announced, uh, you know, 30 odd years ago, uh, as a game that was, being mm-hmm. released. and then only last year or so <laughs> did it get released. So it probably is the longest amount of time for a game's announcement to its actual release, like in game history. Right. So, um, and, uh, I was just going to say real quick for listeners who don't know about the sword quest story. I, I actually have a video of it on my, on the podcast, YouTube channel, but a real brief, Uh, overview of it back in atari's heyday they had a series of games called sword quest where you would play the game and with the game when you when you would buy it would come with a comic book Mm -hmm. uh published by dc if i remember correctly and done by some really amazing like uh amazing uh dick giordano worked on it like a lot of like iconic uh comic book uh, creators worked on it artists and writers and whatnot and you would play the game and as you would play through it, it would give you a page and panel number. You would go to that page, that panel, find the hidden word in the panel. And eventually once you found, once you beat the game and found all the words, you'd have to unscramble the sentence and then send that into Atari and you would have a chance to win some incredible prize. Right. Uh, there is a going to be a total of four games, uh, Earth World, Water World, Fire, or sorry, Earth World, Fire World, Water World, and then the unreleased, well, previous unreleased, but now released thanks to uh, Steven and the team over there at Digital Clips, uh, Air World. The winners, the people who got the sentence correct, would all come back for one final tournament for each game, and the winner of that would win a insane grand prize worth back in like what 1982 or 1980 i think it was 82 right uh like twenty five thousand dollars each yeah that's crazy 
it, I mean, adjust that for inflation. I remember I, the, when I did the video <laughs> adjusted for inflation, it was worth a very nice $69,000. Yeah. It's worth more than that now because inflation ruined right. the joke. Right. But it's freaking inflation. That was a great joke and it just ruined it. <laughs> uh, and they, you know, it, but the prizes were made out of gold and jewel encrusted. There was a talisman. There was a yeah. platinum goblet. There was all these amazing things. And this... Atari, the the you know the North American game crash happens in eighty three. Atari gets hit crazy hard. The tournament never actually finishes. I believe there was a water the water world was sold via mail order, so very few people even right. got it. I think that tournament did happen, but no one knows much about it. And then Airworld never happened. Yeah, it's a very uh, it's a very interesting sort of story. So again, uh, you know, it's I think it's sort of a testament to like our desires to kind of like help finish the story on some of these cases and bring to light some of these famous uh, kind of things that happened in Atari's history. And, and being able to contribute to that was pretty amazing. And another thing you mentioned before with all the rights issues, I can imagine there's a lot of people asking for Activision stuff, but right. understandably so. That's a little bit harder to get when Atari doesn't have the copyrights, yeah. or doesn't have the licenses for all the act the iconic Activision games on the Atari 2600 and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, it's, and, and sorry to interrupt, but like, it's also the no, case no, no. where like, you know, um, you know, we'll always try to, to follow those rights and things like that. And also I think at the time, you know, even though we, we talked to a lot of companies about, about potentially including this stuff, it's really, it was really hard to articulate to companies what we were trying to accomplish with Atari 50 at the time, because we didn't really exactly know at the time uh, of how the mm -hmm. product was going to end up. Um, I think now, you know, if we ever go back to uh, doing more Atari 50 or maybe if, if we do another collection, I think companies like Activision and other folks may be um, more open to uh, being receptive to, to letting us include some of that stuff now to see what the product is like. But during development of it, it was really hard to kind of articulate what we were trying to actually do to them. So. Uh I want to move on real quick because we are getting sure. close to the no end of uh, end of our time period here. Um, I want this, I want you to talk a little bit about the making of Karataka, which is essentially the Atari Fifty treatment, but instead of going over the entire history of it of a single company, this is a really granular deep dive into one specific game's history, which I was so excited for. I don't. I I'm. I'm pretty young. Still, I mean, I'm, right? <laughs> I guess young compared comparatively. I'm I'm 34, so Karataka was before my time, but it is still something that I know of the importance of it. You know, one of the first rotoscope game or the first famous one. Oh yeah, for least. sure. Yeah. Um, and obviously Jordan Mechner's first game, who went on to do Prince of Persia. He's mm -hmm. a, one of the most important game designers of all time. So when I saw that this got announced a, a couple months ago. I was beyond excited for it. I have not been able to pick up my own copy yet because my wife and I are saving up for our house. We have to save money, unfortunately. But I, I, I do want to. I want. I need to pick up a copy of this because, like I was telling you off, Mike, I want to see more projects like this because I think it's amazing. So, uh, me having you on the show is a little bit of my way of apologizing for not being able to <laughs> afford it just yet. But I, I really want this to succeed because i love deep dives on individual games and what you guys are doing you're I, I i mentioned it in the tweet that i think we first connected on digital clips is bringing game history to life in a way that we have not seen yet in by anyone in the game industry so it's awesome to see what you guys are doing so i give that whole big preamble to le send it off to you real to kind of talk about this real quick about the making of Karataka and this really amazing deep dive on one of the most important games of all time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that was great. Um, so, yeah, after Atari 50, which was focused on obviously a big company in a large span of time, um, you know, we've been we've been thinking about this whole Gold Master series for a long time. Um, you know, trying to figure out like what exactly it is and, and what we should do. And we knew that we would probably self-publish these ourselves because there are passion projects and things like that. And so when we want to do the first one, volume one, especially coming off after Atari, you want to do something a little bit more intimate, a, lot, a little bit more smaller in scope and focused. Um, because, you know, all of us have been in the industry here at Digital Clips for, for quite a while. We have our heroes in the industry. We grew up, um, 
you know, playing um, a lot of these developers' games. A lot of developers who, you know, modern audiences may not even know or don't understand their importance or how they impacted the games industry. And so, um, selfishly, we wanted to kind of bring their story to light. And um, Karatika was one that was always in the top of our list as far as such a pivotal, you know, kind of game and how it how it changed the landscape for game development in general. And not only that, but there's this story of of Jordan and Francis's father um, of this father son experience of creating this this game and of a father who who sees that his son is wanting to do something like making games and and allowing him in his own way and not pushing him to just like focus on school um, mm-hmm. 100%. Um, and, and even to a point where his father is being involved in like in, in the motion capture, right. The filming of the, uh, of the footage and the music, mm-hmm. right. Cause he was a musician, a pianist. Um, so it is this very special kind of family story, um, that's very touching. And it also, because, uh, Jordan is a person that w- we can relate to, um, it is an it's an engaging story of of seeing a kid who has this desire to make games, and you can see him progress uh, through his life and through the exchanges with game companies of like, hey, I want to do this, and they're like, oh, you should try to do this, and he does it, and 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 it, you can see him improve and evolve as a game developer, and you can kind of see mm-hmm. the path that he took um, from you know, the very beginning and the early releases of Death Bounce, which, you know, I mean, technically releases, but they didn't, it didn't really get out into the world at all um, to what would become Karatika. And then obviously um, the evolution to what would eventually become Prince of Persia. So I think what's so magical about it is it's like, it's like a human story. It's sort of like our Spider-Man to agree. It's, it's this guy uh, who's in the games industry that we can see ourselves in. Um, and we can see the struggles that he had because he was so meticulous in his note taking. He used to write in a journal, like basically every day, um, his thoughts, his feelings, he kept all the letters from companies. He kept so much stuff, um, that it made our job so much easier because we could easily utilize, um, him as a point to sort of help convey the story and on all of his, we didn't have to ask him to remember this stuff. We could read about this stuff and and show this in his own words to people and so i think in some way in a in going back to this point you were making earlier in this in this era of like triple a these giant games made by these giant machines of developers um we kind of go in the opposite direction we go down to a very much smaller intimate scope where it's mainly one person his dad who's helping to build something that had uh, arguably as much impact on future games as any other triple a game has now right um and so i think that's why we felt that story was really important to tell um it is a because it is such an important game that made such a difference and impacted so many people in the industry in their early days um when mm-hmm. they were also developing games but also it is this story that people who are trying to get into the games industry and are sort of beat down with frustrations for whatever reason, they can see that it was the same case with him. Um, He got rejected on numerous cases or he got told that like, oh, your game is not good enough. You need to make this change and make this change and make this change, right? And even though he did that stuff, oftentimes the game didn't even get released out into the world, right? But yeah. it led to something greater and more remarkable. And, and I think it's a, it's a positive message for anyone to sort of keep trying and, and just you know, know your worth and know where you want to head and, just, and you'll get there. You'll get there. Uh, you may have to struggle through it a bit, but as Jordan's story will tell you, it can lead to great things. Man, you're getting me emotional, and I have to buy a copy of this. Like, I, I, I knew it was because I, I, I saw the trailer and I knew it had a lot of footage archival footage i guess of you know like see like the, the footage that he used to rotoscope the, right. of his dad jumping over cars and stuff which i thought was just one of the coolest things but i i didn't know the personal angle of it this game almost feels like a perfect match for digital eclipse it's an intimate studio that's telling an intimate story about uh 
someone's struggle to that we can all relate to yeah. about trying desperately wanting to do something and having to struggle so hard just to get to some type of recognition for it. Yeah. And it's, it, I can't, I, I, I need to buy this. I can't wait to, <laughs> I can't wait to get my hands on this. I'm actually semi also waiting for the physical release of this, which I believe is limited run. Doing yeah. This. We're, we're talking with them about it uh, for sure. There's no uh, set date on that yet, but yeah, they will be released. Yeah. The, yeah. The physical. I just knew that. I just knew that was announced to the public that that is going to have just no dates yet. Yeah. Um, uh, one last question before I kind of go into wrap ups, and this will just be very quick, uh, because, <laughs> I, man, I could have you back on to talk about so much more stuff. But we're uh, real quick, just talk about the very, very recent release of the Wizardry remake or remaster or whatever you want to call it. The I I'm so excited that this exists. I never got to experience Wizardry yeah. because it's it's very hard to find to play yes. the original version now. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that you guys have the original version of the game running in the background on, as the basis, yes. and then are able to have your own engine kind of playing in tandem with it, it's amazing. So uh, talk a little bit about that, and then we'll go into our wrap up questions. Sure. Um, so you know, whenever we um, have an opportunity, we like to kind of use the original games as the basis because obviously the original games resonated for some reason. Um, we did this originally um, with Yars Revenge and Atari 50 where Yars Revenge, um, the, re the sort of uh, the reimagined game, actually you can switch between the old game and the new game. It actually runs on the core original game. So it's exactly the same. It's just now has a so cool. uh, better visuals and effects and there's bug fixes and stuff like that. So um, with Wizardry, um, there is you know a very large and loyal fan base um, for that IP, and we wanted to make sure that when we did that, that we were paying respect to the original game, right? Um, and uh, you know, as we say, warts and all, right? It's 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 sort of I think the similar reason why Sony entrusted us with doing the remake of Medieval, um, mm -hmm. because. Um, when you're doing sort of a remake, there can be this desire because you, you want to imprint your own kind of sensibilities and sort of perspective onto it. You will change how things feel or how things play. Um, and I think Sony entrusted us to keep all the quirkiness of medieval intact, even though we were making it look better and the music and things like that. But how the character moves and how the enemies react is very much like the original game. Um, and like I said, warts and all, right? There's this sort of like mm -hmm. familiarity that people have with original experience, and we want to capture that. And it's the same thing with wizardry. Why the team sort of felt it was important to have that original version powering the remake is because of that like wizardry fans who've played the original they know how it plays they know the level layouts um they know the little intricacies of how things work and and the timings for stuff and things like that and so we wanted to make sure that we recreated that as accurately obviously as possible and so there was uh, definitely a strong desire from the beginning to utilize the original version as the foundation for this and how it runs is how our new wizardry runs. And, and like you said, you can see that by bringing up sort of the window of the original game running and you can see what the original looked like and how the modern version looks like, right? Um, obviously, as with everything else, we kind of go through and we add quality of life improvements, uh, we fix bugs and we improve certain areas and things like that. Um, but we do that as, as a way to sort of modernize the stuff, not to take away from the original experience, but to deliver on sort of what expectations are for modern audiences, right? Um, and mm -hmm. in most cases, even when we do that, in the same with Wizardry, we may add a lot of quality of life improvements, but they're generally always optional. That way, we give you the tools, the way you play it is up to you, right? You make that decision. You want to play it like exactly like it played originally, then you can. If you want to have these quality of life improvements turned on, you can. So we always like to give that choice to the player. That's a, a very important part of every sort of collection that or product that we release. Um, so, you know, the team uh, worked really hard on sort of capturing the essence of widgery and making it as accurate as possible, but obviously making it look better, um, you know, improving the just the look of everything and reinterpreting how the enemies look in comparison to the old stuff and, and things like that and sort of putting their little bit of mark on it. But, you know, we wanted to get out there for folks, um, you know, 
this product still has a lot of stuff that we still want to improve and fix and address uh, on it. Um, but we really want to get the feedback of fans and you know people who've been playing Wizardry for a long time. Like, what do you want to see in this product? What do you want to improve? Like, what things do you want us to add? And I think that's where the impetus for this early access kind of came from. It gives us an opportunity to have sort of this dialogue with the oh, audience yeah. while we're still working on it so that hopefully the end product is exactly what fans are hoping for, right? Um, and they can kind of see it progress along the way. And they also can feel that they're involved in the development process, right? They're contributing to it um, in some way. And I think because the fan base of Widry is so passionate and been around for such a long time, it really made sense to engage in that way. Um, so it's it's kind of a neat experience for us uh, obviously, we this is not normally something we would do in this sort of fashion, but it kind of made sense um, because there's a lot of ways you can kind of take wizardry, and we want to make sure that we're delivering on expectations of the fans in every way. And so the best way to do that seemingly was to like release something that was most of the way there, um, and is mm. by all intents and purposes a, a finished product, but. There's always stuff that we can add, tweak. We have, you know, hopefully plans for console releases in the future if things go well. But really what we want to focus on right now is getting the PC version finished and to a point where everyone who enjoys Wizardry is really happy with it. And then we'll kind of take it from there, hopefully. So that's a smart way to do it, especially with a game that has such passionate fans as the Wizardry does. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a smart way to do it. And uh, for my listeners, say, just to add a little bit of context of why Wizardry is such a important release, um, it was one of the biggest influences on Yuji Hori, who ended up creating Dragon Quest, mm -hmm. who then Dragon Quest helped spawn Final Fantasy. And like Wizardry is pretty much the inspiration for what we know now as the... Uh, "Quote unquote JRPG genre, yeah, uh, yeah. So it, it it's really cool to see it kind of come the original version of it come back in such a unique and fun way. Um, one, I have one more question before yeah, I no wrap problem. up. I'm sorry, this is something that oh, just uh, popped in my head. Without without breaking any NDAs, uh, what's an IP or collection that you would personally love to see digital clips do with a documentary style, like a documentary style game with? Oh yeah, that's a good one. I have a couple of thoughts, but the fun one that I would love to do that will never get made, um, but I've always wanted to do is sort of like the um, collection of kind of one hit wonders, like the eight bit, 16 bit mascots games, mm. like the arrow, the acrobats. I mean, some of those you've seen come back like <laughs> James Pond and things like that, but there was a myriad of like, you know, there was this attempt when Sonic and awesome, Mario were awesome. clashing. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. There was this myriad of like <laughs> of one off sort of properties um, that got released when people were trying to find mascots that really clicked. And I think that's such an interesting period of time. A lot of these games are actually quite good. I love platformers and, and obviously most of them were kind of action platformers but sort of a, a kind of a collection that 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 kind of goes through this journey of like uh, different companies attempts at trying to create mascots that connected you know to, in order to connect with gamers and stuff and, and ones that kind of succeeded and ones that failed and and where are those mascots now like you know have there been remakes of them or have they disappeared into obscurity um, i think that would be kind of a fun interesting um, sort of collection because a lot of people have heard of these mascots, but they might not have played the games. And, uh, you know, that's always sort of a, a kind of a fun one that I have um, on the side. The the serious one, the more serious one, because I'm sort of a Sega Saturn fan is, is, is sort of being able to have a collection of like something like the uh, Sega Saturn fighting games or something like that um, mm -hmm. would be, would be fun or just like, focusing on a console like that, like the Sega Saturn and Sega's uh, sort of history through that console platform, right? It's like we've done Atari like over the 50 years. What would it be like to do something like Sega on a particular console and like the evolution of that, right? That would uh, be so cool to like see. Something like that. There's a lot of stuff you could do with that. But, um, you know, those are two examples, one serious and one sort of silly. But I think both of them are kind of cool ideas that I'd love. I, I probably will never get to do, but would love to do at some point. I mean, you could call it the Lost Mascot Collection. Yeah, like that would be such a that's, a, that's a, like a good title. I think it would be evocative. Anyway, um, I will have to have you back on some other time because I do have other questions. But we will, I will spare you those and save them for another time. Uh, to wrap up, I I asked my guests uh, two different questions to end each episode. Mm -hmm. One 
is from the Alan Alda podcast, Clear and Vivid. I'm a huge fan of that podcast where it's all about communication. And he asks, he ends his podcast with seven questions. I'm not going to ask you all seven. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, and I, he has seven questions that I, I find really interesting. And I normally pick one or two of – I normally pick one of them. And I'm going to actually ask you one that I have not asked any of my previous guests so okay. far. So this question is, what's the strangest question anyone has ever asked you? Um, wow. That is a, that is a good question. Um, I'd have to think about that one. What is the weirdest question? Um, well, besides the one I just asked, I guess, you know, I think the one that comes to mind (laughs) is for some reason, um, I somehow have this immune ability to make pretty good popcorn. Um, (laughs) and I was at a a friend's house and I was making popcorn in his house and I was just using seasonings and stuff like that. And, um, just arbitrarily someone was eating that and they were just like, they're like, you know, what makes your popcorn so special? Because I I didn't know that they were aware that like I had made the popcorn or anything, uh, but Mm -hmm. they were told that. And so I was just sitting there and we're talking about something and then they stopped talking. They said like, what makes your popcorn so special? And, uh, (laughs) and I was taken aback because I didn't know how to react initially to that. And then I said, Oh, Oh, okay. And then, so in, in, in recent history, that's probably something that (laughs) I remember that's completely out of context, but uh, the one that took me by surprise because I I didn't (laughs) understand it initially but uh there you go (laughs) what's even more wild about that answer you just gave is my second closing question um is what i call it's a section of the of my interviews called questions from courtney Mm -hmm. but uh, but, but, uh, questions (laughs) from courtney um i give some other fast food jingle every time it's usually mcdonald's because i can't think of anything else but anyway courtney is my wife and she famously according uh at least famous to my listeners knows that she's or my listeners know she is not into any of this stuff she's not into gaming she's not into geeky stuff nerd culture any of the th- any of these things that i yeah, talk about on my show totally understandable so so i always like to ask her a question i always like to ask her to give me a question for my guests mm-hmm. because she knows nothing about what they do <laughs> so the question tonight is and it, it bizarrely ties into your answer here what's your secret talent uh, secret. I don't know if you're going to count pop. You can answer popcorn if you like making a mean, a mean bowl of popcorn. But, uh, if there's anything else, feel free to go into. Well, I'll do two. My two towns. Cause most people, I don't talk about this. One was, um, I was a very good swimmer for quite a few years in my high school, okay. college. I was a competitive swimmer, almost made it to the Olympics to a degree. Whoa. Um, uh, okay. But, uh, so there's that what? that most people don't know me, and then the second thing, which is always surprising, is that I was uh, a very good trombone player too, and did a lot of competitions and toured around the United States doing competitions with my uh, a jazz band at, in the high school, um, competing. And uh, so those are the two things that most people don't know of me. But yeah, I swam for quite a few years, and uh, I played trombone. So there you go. I actually also played trombone in high school. Nowhere near uh, traveling around level, but I, I did play trombone in high school oh, for nice. a number of years. That's kind of funny. But yeah, all right, man. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode, Stephen. I've had such a good time chatting with you. I, I would love to have you back on again at some point to, I don't know what, we'll, we'll figure something out, yeah. but if, if you'd be willing to. I, I loved ch- talking to you about all this stuff. So before I let you go, where can my listeners find you? And is, of course, beside, well, feel free to shout out what the stuff we've been talking about again, but is there anything else you'd like to promote? Um, yeah. If you want to find out more about digital clips, um, obviously you can go to digitalclips.com. We're on also every, so literally every social network, including the new Blue ones, sky, Blue skies, everything. everything you can just search for uh, digital clips. Uh, but the main point of sort of reference uh, that you can go to is digitalclips.com. We also have a newsletter um, that we always encourage people to sign up. Um, I'm actually a part of. Yeah. And so we don't send out that many newsletters and, and in the past we have known to uh, send people free games uh, that we create these exclusive uh, seasonal games um, that uh, sometimes we surprise people with. So you may never know, like if you're a subscriber, you may end up getting a free game out of it. Uh, but I do promise that we don't send them out um, too regularly um, and if you just want to chat with me about what Digital Clips does and things like that, my main thing is uh, on Twitter is at uh, Frostman007 because I like James Bond so much. Um, but yeah, feel free to sign up for our newsletter or go to our website and find out all the latest uh, stuff that we're working on. 
that's honestly a little serendipitous because I, I you'll find out why in just a moment after I give my go through my shout outs. Um, of course, listeners can find me at Still Loading Pod on pretty much every social media place, not all, but a lot. Blue Sky, Twitter, Threads, Instagram, Facebook, Twitch, uh, all that good stuff at Still Loading Podcast on YouTube. If you want to support the show, you can do so in a number of ways. You can give it a five star rating or review on Apple Podcast or whichever podcasting app you use because it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. and I like feeling warm and fuzzy. Um, you can also, what is it? Podcast Addict has their own in-house rating system. So if, you, if you're on the Podcast Addict app, feel free to throw a rating to me over there. If you want to support the show monetarily, you can go to patreon.com slash stillloadingpod. For a dollar a month, you can get all the episodes a little bit early with better audio quality as well as access to patron voting rights, which the time this is being recorded, but it'll be over by the time this episode comes out uh i'm doing a whole poll on trying to figure out a psp game to play uh, i have four different options so if you want to help guide the direction of the show you can become a patron for as little as a dollar but there's more to it than that at the four dollar level you'll get everything that i mentioned previously plus access to two bonus mini episodes every month and then at the five dollar level this ties back to what i was talking about about before steven you get access to still bonding my james bond podcast <laughs> where me and a couple friends bond over 007 we're going through it movie by movie this episode is coming out in october so we are going to be uh, i don't know if it'll be out already or close to be out when this drops but we are going to be talking about the first Timothy Dalton film, The Living Daylight. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, everything over at patreon.com slash stillloadingpod. But, of course, I want to shout out my friends over at the Bit by Bit Foundation. The Bit by Bit Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to put video games and video game consoles in the hands of kids receiving inpatient care at hospitals. So if you want to support them, go to bitbybitfoundation.org and consider donating. That is all the time I have for you on this episode of Still Loading. Steven, once again, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. And I will see you all next time. Bye.